I'm gonna play the intro. Hold on, not yet, not yet, not yet. What my shit is There we go. Welcome to the Black on Black Crypto Podcast. The Black on Black Crypto Podcast. With BGZ, K-Rock, and Shea Royals. Tonight, we run with the bulls on the Black on Black Crypto Podcast. Crypto Podcast. What's up, people? It's your boy BG back in the building. I got the homie Keith with me. Black on Black Crypto, man. We back with another episode today to answer the question of why Bitcoin. I know everybody asking why Bitcoin. Why do why is this important? Why do we feel that we need to come talk to y'all about discuss Bitcoin? So we're gonna do a say a explanation a explanation video today uh, of why Bitcoin. And hopefully, when y'all watch this video with us, um, y'all can understand. Y'all can understand more about what this guy is talking about. But in the event that y'all do not understand, we're going to break it down in what I like to call our terms in a way that we can understand it by just because in the video, the guy says a lot of terms and vernacular and terminology that I had to go Google. I had to go look it up because I didn't know what the definition was. So we're gonna roll it. We're gonna roll the tape. Y'all watch the video and enjoy it. Uh, we're gonna stop it here and there to break down some key points so it doesn't get too confusing. All right, let's do that. And I, uh, I'm gonna link the clip in YouTube uh, for YouTube too to so you can watch the entire video because we're not gonna watch the entire video they do a q a after after and uh it gets it gets a little bit more in depth all right so let's just get into that video without further ado please help me welcome we have something up fair use fair use for educational purposes only good morning everyone Let's start with a quick uh, poll here. How many of you have used a digital currency like Bitcoin at least once? And how many of you own Bitcoin at this moment or any other digital currency? Okay, we can fix that. If you like, later on today, come find me. I would be delighted to demonstrate to you how to set up a Bitcoin wallet on your smartphone. And I will give you your first fraction of a Bitcoin, not a whole Bitcoin. And show you how a transaction works. Because Bitcoin and the digital currency revolution it has started is best demonstrated and experienced than explained it's actually very difficult to explain bitcoin i've spent the last five years learning how to explain bitcoin that is my full-time job unfortunately the developers keep making new stuff which i then have to explain all over again so for a moment forget everything you think you know about bitcoin 
Forget everything you've heard about blockchain, and let's start from basics. In 2011, I heard about Bitcoin for the first time. And my reaction was exactly the same as the reaction of everybody else who heard about Bitcoin the first time, including its founder. And that reaction was, ha, nerd money. That's probably just for gambling. Six months later, I heard about Bitcoin again. And this time, I read the white paper that launched this system. And my background in computer science and distributed systems allowed me to see behind the illusion of what I thought Bitcoin was, and it blew my mind. In my life, I have now had six occasions in which I have become absolutely obsessed with a system of technology to the point of forgetting to eat, forgetting to sleep, and consuming as much knowledge as I possibly can. My first computer, when I was 10 years old, my first programming language experience, my first modem, my first access to the web, the first time I used the web browser, the first time I downloaded and installed the Linux operating system, and then Bitcoin. When I discovered it, I spent four months consuming as much as I could, except food. I lost 26 pounds on the highly inadvisable diet of obsession. I have not emerged from that, because I keep finding new layers of depth to understand this. And the reason it's so fascinating is because it isn't what it appears to be at first glance. Bitcoin isn't money. The blockchain isn't a system of currency. <laughs> it is a platform of trust. It's not a company. It's not a product. It's not a service you sign up for. It's not a currency. Currency is just the first application. It is the concept of decentralization applied to the human communication of value. Because what is money? NQ told us it's an illusion. It's imaginary. And the reason we don't grasp that is because it's so deeply embedded in our civilization. <clears throat> money is one of the oldest technologies that humanity has. It <clears throat> precedes writing. How do we know that? The very first samples of writing we have are spreadsheets. They are tallies and ledgers of debts owed, and money pre-existed that writing. You might even speculate that money had an oral tradition until it needed to invent a written tradition, so writing was created for it. In the history of money that now spans tens of thousands of years, there have been maybe five major changes. From pure barter exchange, to the introduction of the first abstraction of value, shells, feathers, beads, nuts, stones, and then precious metals, and then paper money, and then plastic money, and now network money. Bitcoin introduces a platform on which you can run currency as an application on a network without any central points of control, a system completely decentralized like the internet itself. It is not money for the internet, but the internet of money. And what is money? Money is a language. Money 
is a linguistic abstraction. Money is a language that we use to communicate value to each other. Money simply allows us to express value, and that value may have economic <coughs> consequences, but it also has other consequences. We use money to express and create social bonds and relationships and associations and to create organization. Bitcoin is the first system of money that is not controlled by any entity that is completely decentralized. All right, so let's stop the video right there. Do a little little breakdown real quick of what he's saying. We're gonna break it down in terms that we can understand. So he said Bitcoin is the is not money, it's the internet of money. Meaning it's a medium of exchange. Back way before we had dollars, they had gold. Before they had gold, we was trading pebbles, we was trading stones cows chickens whatever you perceive as something valuable basically a barter system whatever you perceive as value that's what we traded hell we still do it now if somebody got a pair of tennis shoes that you want if somebody got something that they own that you want and you want to trade for something else that can be used as seen as money like it doesn't have to be actual cash dollars i know that's what a lot of us would, would prefer but Bitcoin is the internet of money, so that makes it global. You can't trade tennis shoes global without the middleman, which is eBay. Bitcoin cuts out that middleman. He's going to get to that in a minute, but Bitcoin completely cuts out that middleman, and you can trade peer-to-peer -peer with nobody, with no interruptions. Bitcoin um, cannot be stopped once that transaction is sent. It gets to that person and it settles within 15 minutes. So that is what he means when he says the internet of money. And when he says decentralized, that means nobody, no entity controls it. Bitcoin has no owner. Bitcoin has no CEO. So Bitcoin itself is decentralized in the fact that no one owns it. And that in itself is, is, is governed by rules, rules and code. So nobody can go in and change that code. That code is set and it cannot it cannot be altered. Bitcoin is an open ledger. When he said the spreadsheets, Bitcoin is an open public ledger. If you have the internet, you can go view all the Bitcoin transactions that have ever been made. Now, are you going to do that? Probably not. That's what none of us going to do that, honestly. So, but if you were into that and you were that nerd out about, about Bitcoin itself or crypto, you can go view that public ledger and nothing can be hidden now there are no names on this ledger it's just bitcoin addresses and we actually going to show y'all about that later about the bitcoin address because we're going to move money from coinbase to kraken to show y'all how to do that and then we're going to dc again later all right let's go back to the video and what that does is it introduces the very same things that the internet brought to communication. <clears throat> if money is speech, if money is a language, and you disconnect it from all other media, and you make it pure speech, pure content, an internet content type, a protocol designation, money over IP, it completely separates it from all of these previous notions of nations, sovereign issuers, institutions that control. And so we go from institution-based money to network-based money. And of course, everyone will welcome this with open arms. Not a chance. What do you think they said the first time someone was presented with a gold depository certificate instead of a gold coin. 
they said, that's not money. Go away. What do you think happened in 1950, the first time someone showed up at a motel and presented their diner's club membership card and said, I'll pay with this piece of paper. That's not money. Go away. And now we're on the verge of a new transformation of money. We're on the verge of creating the first completely global, completely borderless, completely decentralized, and completely open form of money. One where you can build applications because this money is programmable. And you don't need to ask anyone's permission to launch an application any more than you need to ask permission to launch an application on the internet. And the only All right, so just like I told you he's going to get into it, he's going to talk about it's permissionless. Bitcoin is program programmable money. All right? So for me myself, I like permissionless. I hate going to the ATM and they get to tell me how much money I get to take out. I hate going to the bank. And if you withdraw over a certain amount of money, they tell you, you got to come back tomorrow. We don't have your money right now. I don't like that. If I'm making these transactions, I want to be able to make them without a middleman and somebody to tell me that I can't do it. And when he was saying Bitcoin wasn't accepted, it wasn't accepted with welcome with open arms, just like electricity. When they first heard about electricity, you think the people just welcomed it? Nah, they still want to light candles, kerosene lamps, whatever. They want to light up the fireplace, whatever it was they were using to create light. Now, also cell phones. At first, cell phones weren't so welcome. Everybody wasn't welcome to the idea of having cell phones. Cell phones is a network. And what happens with a network once everybody joins the network? Now, the network is worldwide. You can Apple, you can iMessage worldwide. You got WhatsApp. You got all these messages apps that you can message instantly worldwide because everybody joined this network. Now, Bitcoin is the network of money. So, with that being said, there's a certain a, a finite amount of Bitcoin, twenty one million. So when everybody joins this network, what do you think is going to happen to the price? Bitcoin is going to create a new meaning for wealth, for the wealthy. And for those that are wealthy now, for them to continue in their wealth, they are going to have to accumulate Bitcoin or their future may be uncertain. So that being said, let's jump back to the video and let me explain a little bit more. requirement to have a successful application on the internet of money is two interested participants that is your market segment and you have an application and a million applications will flourish when you push innovation to the edges of the network when you remove the requirement for permission what happens exponential explosion in innovation the applications that could not be built on the old systems of money because they required permission, because they required a significantly large market segment, because they required adoption by many in order to be available at all. Now, none of those requirements exist. Anyone in the world can download an application or use even a feature phone with text messaging and immediately acquire the same powers that institutions of banking have today. And when I say anyone, that's only scratching the surface. Because ironically enough, not only does Bitcoin and blockchain currency not recognize borders, it also does not recognize people. It doesn't matter if you're a person or a refrigerator, or a self-driving car. Throughout the history of money, ownership of currency required personhood, either 
as an individual or as an association of individuals in a corporation. Bitcoin can be owned by machines. Bitcoin can be owned by software agents. Machines can pay each other. And that is not just about economic activity. It's the basis for market-based security systems. It's the basis for creating bonds of authentication between devices. It's the basis of new applications that have never been done before. Bitcoin and blockchain technology unifies the systems of money. Today we have systems of money for small payments, systems of money for large payments. We have systems of money for payments between individuals. We have systems of money for payments between companies. We have systems of money for payments between governments. Does that remind you of something? That's how communication used to be before the internet. We had systems of communication for pictures, systems of communication for letters, systems of communication for short distance and long distance, and the internet came and unified all of those. What the internet of money does is it creates a single network which can do a microtransaction to a giga transaction in seconds anywhere in the world for any participant without permission. But if you just look at the application of money, you're missing the point. Because you can take for language the building blocks of this platform and use them to construct other languages that communicate value. Tokens, reward points, brand loyalty coins. Today there are over a thousand digital currencies using the design pattern, the recipe of Bitcoin. <clears throat> Most of them are junk. Some of them. All right, let's pause right there real quick. Now he mentioned uh, it, a lot of things being basically tokenized. You can talk about loyalty points. Everybody that has credit cards, you have loyalty points. If you go to your favorite restaurant, favorite fast food place, they got apps for loyalty points, a way to earn, earn whatever you're earning, earn points for to get free food, earn points for frequent flyer miles. All these things in the future are going to be tokenized, built off the Bitcoin platform. Now, like you said, a lot of these to tokens or coins are crap. We like to call them shit coins. Some of them are called meme coins, and they have no value. Now, some of them are actually going to have some value. A lot of them is going to be the Apples and the Googles and the Verizons and the uh, all the all the all the different companies that are flourishing now. Ten to twenty years from now, the coins that are actually have a use case are going to become these companies. So he's going to get to that point too, and just. The, he also mentioned the fact that payments are borderless. Like I said, this is the internet of money. You don't need an intermediary anymore. And that puts you on the same level as banks. And, that, and that's what all the generational wealth gurus, podcasters, they preach becoming your own bank. What better way than to become your own bank than by owning Bitcoin or owning cryptocurrency? Now you're essentially your own bank. You are separating yourself from the traditional financial system and become your own bank so you can do with your funds what you please you are the owner of your own destiny now so all the things that you aspire to do whether it be uh, business related personal you can do these things using bitcoin and cryptocurrency on a daily basis and once again you don't have to have permission to do it you can just do it all right back to the video them are not and over the next decades we are going to see tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of coins some will have economic use some will simply be expressions of loyalty affiliation they will represent <clears throat> items in the physical world the title for a house <clears throat> the controlling key for a car that can be transferred from one owner to another, and five seconds later, that owner can step into the car and drive away, because the car can validate the new standard of ownership. 
We cannot yet imagine what applications we're going to build around this. But one of the interesting things we're beginning to observe is that money arises out of the social construct of Homo sapiens spontaneously. It even arises in primates. You can teach monkeys money. You can teach dolphins money. You can teach greys, parrots, money. And they will learn how to exchange abstract tokens for food and then use them to build social relationships. They'll also invent strong arm robbery. Beat up the other monkey, take away its pebbles, eat the bananas. And we see that same thing happen in children. Toddlers invent money in kindergarten. Blocks and rubber bands and Pokemon cards and other little tokens, abstractions of value that they exchange to strengthen social bonds, to express loyalty and friendship, to learn about sharing. Children will be building currencies. Only this time, these currencies will be global, unforgeable, and scalable on day one. A few years from now, Maria will be launching Maria coin in her kin kindergarten to compete against Joey coin. And it won't really matter to anyone. Until, of course, Justin Bieber launches Justin Bieber coin, and it happens to surpass the market capitalization of 30 nations on this planet. And we are all writing horrified opinion editorials about how the world is going to hell. <laughs> What's happening with this technology is astonishingly deep. And for certainly some of the companies in this room, it's a bit scary. Banking has never been the most innovative sector in the world, because there is a very careful balance between innovation and the conservative fiduciary duty that exists in banking, that must exist when you control other people's money. All right, let's stop it right there. So once again, I told you we were going to break this down in terms that we can understand. Like I told you, he's going to say a lot of words that don't make sense. This dude got a background in computer science. If you don't know what computer science is, those are some really smart people that are very, extremely good at math. I'm good at math, but I'm not that good at math. Uh, they write code, they uh, do a lot of programming issues, so they probably program that iPhone that we use. These are these type of people that uh, have a background in computer science. So he mentioned a very important word, uh, fiduciary responsibility, and that's connected to what uh, the traditional financial system is supposed to do for us. Fiduciary responsibility. Now, what does that mean? Because this sounds like a very important word. So the fiduciary responsibility, it involves actions taken in the best interest of another person or entity. That's uh, the, the main definition of it. Fiduciary duty describes the relationship between um, an attorney and a client or a guardian and a ward. So basically, they are supposed to be acting in good faith and loyal to the person that they're uh, supposed to be taking care of. So the fiduciary duties include duty of care, loyalty, good faith, confidentiality, prudence, and disclosure. All right. So that's basically what a bank, financial, your financial advisor, your um, whoever you um, who has who you trust with your money, they have a fiduciary responsibility to have your best interest in mind, and you're giving that responsibility to them. Now, you can take that responsibility back now, thanks to Bitcoin. You don't have to worry about them or another person, another individual having your best interests in, at heart or in mind. So he's going to talk about fiduciary responsibility more. I just want to give you that little tidbit. So like I said, we got to break this down because it get real complicated sometimes, especially when you are new to this, trying to understand what he's saying. So fiduciary responsibility. 
Now we, now we got a quick definition of it. Let's keep the video going. And yet with Bitcoin, you don't control other people's money. In Bitcoin, <clears throat> I control my money. I have complete and total authority over my Bitcoin. It cannot be seized. It cannot be frozen. It cannot be censored. My transactions cannot be intercepted and they cannot be stopped. And I can do so with almost complete anonymity, and so can anyone five minutes after they download an application, and money has changed forever, and banking has changed forever. The idea that you can proceed in the industry of money, in the industries of commerce, and maintain the same conservative attitude that has existed now for centuries. Ever since merchants in Venice and Amsterdam started issuing depository certificates and providing banking services, that is gone. That is gone. You cannot operate closed systems that have borders and require permission to join at a rate of innovation that is controlled by the most conservative tendencies within your organization because now you are competing with a technology that enables exponential growth exponential innovation at the edges without permission by anyone in the world and it's not about anyone in this room why we represent the privileged elite. I can go onto a brokerage account, open it up online, and be trading on the Tokyo stock market within 12 hours in yen. That is the privilege that I have. <clears throat> One and a half billion people have that privilege. Six billion people can operate mainly in one currency and perhaps have some basic banking services. Four billion people are significantly underbanked, and an astonishing two and a half billion people are completely unbanked. All right, let's start right there. So, real quick, let's break that down. So he's just saying <clears throat> the privileged elite are us in a good old America. <laughs> what he mean by that, we can go open a bank account without fear of our money being stolen. Our money is pretty much safe up to a certain amount in the U.S. banks. Now, when you go into other countries, when you go into international countries, they say, say Argentina, for example, the, the Argentina uh, 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 currency is complete trash. It's been inflated to oblivion. So, And they can't necessarily go to a bank and deposit their money because I forget the exact history on this, but in Argentina, uh, at one point in time, they had money in the bank, and next thing you know, they inflated the currency away. So that money was essentially worthless. And then the banks and the government were so corrupt, they basically just took the people's money. If it was in the bank, they took it took your money. Uh, Turkey is another country that's suffering heavy from inflation. The Turkish lira is getting inflated away big time. Excuse me, and it's just losing value by the day. And as it continues to lose value and they can't necessarily put their money in banks, even if they put their money in banks, it's, it's, if it's in the Turkish lira, it's steadily losing value. Same goes for your U.S. dollar. Your money, If you're saving money, which is great, saving money, your money is losing value year to year. But the funny thing about it, they actually tell you that. They tell you inflation is 2 to 3% every year anyway. So if you have $100,000 in your, in your savings account, and it just happened to sit there for 50 years. By the time that 50 years come, you still got that same 100,000. That 100,000 is now worth 50,000 because two to three percent over 50 years is worth nothing. And they literally tell you that. So if you don't invest your money, you're gonna lose your money. And we are privileged in America, like I said, we can go open a bank account, right? But if you're in another country, you just can't go open a bank account. That's not how it works. And even if you open a bank account, your money is not necessarily safe. They can come take your money. Now, that's what he means by the privileged elite. So I'll let him continue talking about the video. 
And while while uh he uh while while the video plays, I'll be answering questions in the chat. So if you have questions in the chat, go ahead and drop them in there. Even if you have coins that you want us to review and go look at the charts and go find some information for you, we can do that. But please put that please put the coins in the chat. They will leapfrog. <laughs> they will never have a relationship with a bank. Every single child born today will never have a bank account. They will have a bank app. A bank app that doesn't give them an account. A bank app that makes them a banker. An international banker in an app. They will not be permitted to open a bank account until they're 16 years old. By that time, I hope they will have at least six or more years of experience with digital currencies. And I would like to watch them walk into a bank branch to have someone explain to them what three to five business days means. It is highly likely that children born today will never get a driving license because they'll have self-driving cars, but they will also never use paper money. Because by the time they get to an age where they really start using money, there is no paper money. It will seem as anachronistic as a fax machine or horse and buggy seems to us. Exponential innovation on a global basis. All right, let's stop right there. Let's chime in on that real quick. It's crazy to think that your kids, especially their kids, will never use paper money. It's a lot of us that don't use paper money now unless we absolutely have to. We literally go places. We tap in our phone now. We tap in our card. We won't even slide the card no more. I haven't slid my card in years. I got no idea what that feel like no more. Even if somebody needs, if I need to send somebody some money somewhere, I'm using Apple Pay. I'm using Venmo. We don't use paper money really a whole lot now, unless it's just for a flex. You know, we like to flex. You know, we got some money, we like to flex. But if you think about it, all your money right now is, is already on the ledger and it's in an app, it's in a bank. You know, you can access it from your phone. It's still up to a certain amount, though. And there's a lot of layers in between it, depending on what you need to do with the money, how much money you need, and where you need to send the money to. So it's a lot of layers in between, a lot of middlemen, a lot of red tape, to, for lack of better words. So to eliminate that red tape, insert Bitcoin. You know, eliminate it eliminates all of that. Hey, Jarrell, to answer your question, so do I need to get a crypto wallet or money out to get my money out or just to protect my money? <laughs> I'm going to answer that question in a minute. Let me, let's finish the video real quick and I'm going to get, get back to that question. Giving access to the other six billion. They have enormous need and this system offers them a solution. It's not ready yet. It's nascent, it's complex, it's impossible to use for most people. In 1989, I sent my first email. In order to do so, I had to compile a version of the Unix mail program using a C compiler and Unix command line skills. I had to set it up on the command line, type out my email, and that email was transmitted across the great internet in an astonishing three days. Exactly 20 years later, my mother replicated that experience with a swipe. Wait, 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 Bitcoin. we gotta stop. Let's stop and analyze that real quick. Brad said he just sent the email and y'all just saw all the vernacular that he used. That's some complicated crap. Like it can tell how intelligent this dude is and the, the vast knowledge he's had of how the inner work is a uh, programming works. So he said he crafted an email and it took three days 
to send that email. Fast forward 20 years, his mother sent the email with a swipe. Right now, Bitcoin is relatively easy to use, relatively, but you do have to understand a couple of things before you dive in. Now, back in 2017, when I, when I first got started, I think I was on the phone with Coinbase for like 30 minutes. I did not understand how this worked. I was just trying to uh, change money, change uh, dollars into Bitcoin. And even after they helped me figure it out, I still ain't know what's happening. It's much easier now, and we are here to get you step by step to that process. And we're going to explain it in ways that we understand. And you ain't talking to this guy. Or you ain't talking to a, 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 another person that don't look like us. We'll, under, we'll explain it in a way that's easy to understand. Now, we can walk you to the water, but we can't make you drink. Because this is not financial advice. This is for education purpose only. But please hit us up if you got questions. All right, back to the video. So today, and all of the currencies that are built on that recipe are just at the same level that the internet was in 1991. Only now, we have the internet. And so the rate of exponential growth has already started. The innovation is growing at an astonishing rate. I spend every single day full time trying to keep up with Bitcoin. Just one currency, and it's almost impossible. Do not underestimate this. Do not listen to the people who tell you that Bitcoin is just for pornographers, terrorists, drug dealers, and gamblers. Remember that they said the exact same thing about the internet. And when you give it to two or three billion people, they're not interested in those things. They're interested in sharing cat videos. And now we have an internet of a billion cat videos. When you take digital currency mainstream and give it to the four billion people who have been isolated from international finance and commerce, and you give them the opportunity to control their money against despotic governments and corrupt banks that are stealing from them, you give them the opportunity to control their future, you give them the opportunity to transact with everyone in the world, to own title on their own property, in a fully transferable digital token that is recognized everywhere. Control over finance that cannot be seized, frozen, or censored. They will buy food, health care, sanitation, education, shelter, because that is what we do. And they will not be denied this technology. Do not underestimate where this is going. The Internet of Money was launched on January 3, 2009. It is coming. It is coming faster than you can imagine. It is deeper than you can fathom. It is more sophisticated than you can immediately understand. It takes years of study just to see all of the implications. And it is a gift to the entire world, a technology that represents the sixth greatest innovation in the technology of money, the most ancient technology of our civilization. Thank you. All right, cool. That's that video. I hope you enjoyed the video. Now, <clears throat> before I get into it, I'm going to answer your real, uh, Tan Man question real quick. So do I need a crypto wallet to get my money out or is it just to protect my money? Now, that depends on is your money your money sound like your money is still on the exchange. So if your money is still on the exchange, um it's it's technically safe. Uh, it just if you want to add another layer of protection, then you need to put your money in your crypto wallet. You can have a hot wallet, which is uh, just another. It's like an app on your phone, too. There's many hot wallets that you can choose from. Or you can go put it into cold storage, which is more like a thumb drive with a take it off. Uh, you can take it off the Internet completely. 
you know, that can add you another layer of protection. And when you say get your money out, you got to uh, help me understand about what you mean by get your money out. Now, to wrap up this video with all the complicated things he said, uh, if you didn't understand something in the video, please drop that in the chat too so I can answer that question for you. But long story short, he said give Bitcoin to 4 billion people. Now, currently, Bitcoin has about 50 million users. I think I see some. Let's just say about 20% of the population owns a piece of Bitcoin. So 20% of the population, let's just say 150 million people own Bitcoin. This guy said billions. Give it to billions. Four billion people. That's excluding the United States. You give it to four billion people, what do you think is going to happen to the price of Bitcoin once you give it to four billion people to use and transact in? Simple math, simple economics 101, finite supply, increased demand, the price going to the moon. We already, we already on the rocket ship already. We headed that direction. You heard he say, don't underestimate Bitcoin. Take the time. What, what, what's going to happen, PG? Because it's going to be a demand like you talk about, right? After that, after so many people is, you know, adopted by the masses and it's widespread, bro, I know you understand, but the people need to understand that it's a hundred million Satoshis in one Bitcoin. Meaning that this thing, one Bitcoin can be breaking down, broken down a hundred times. So Bitcoin is going to be in such demand, like everybody is going to be able to get a little bitty piece of a Bitcoin. Just imagine if you have somewhere near a full Bitcoin. So you got to think about like if you was able to get Amazon in the video at, you know, when there was a dollar. When it was ten dollars, like that's that's the power that we're talking about right now, you know. So you know Amazon had a stock split. So you was let, let's say like because that's basically what's gonna happen after, you know, it's only a little bit of in circulation or all of it is is gone. It's gonna split into satoshis and it's gonna be become even more powerful. But go ahead, BG. Yeah, it's gonna it it by I think the last Bitcoin is gonna be mine in like 2050, something like that. And let Michael Saylor tell it, we're in the Bitcoin gold rush. Like this is the gold rush for us millennials that we weren't around for. We heard about it. People that acquired all the gold became the wealthiest people in the, in the nation and the world. So this is the Bitcoin gold rush. If you want to become wealthy, then you might want to get you a piece of Bitcoin. Even if it's a little piece, you need to have something. So, with all that said, I hope, like I said, I hope y'all enjoyed the video. Uh, yeah, definitely, I would say uh, I'm, I'm, I'm brainwashed at this point. This is one of the reasons I'm brainwashed watching videos like that. Um, he doesn't break it down as well as some other people may, may break it down, but he does a pretty good job. Um, now, all that. What's up, K Rock? We got K Rock in the building. You know what I'm saying? But I got, got my boy in. So, last time we uh, was on her last Thursday, we, we 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 did pod earlier a couple times this week just because Bitcoin was on the heater and we had to talk about it. So, last time we out here last Thursday, Bitcoin was sitting at about $63,000. It went all the way up to 69,000, broke his all time high. And then that thing dropped like a, a, a rock, like a rock from the sky, it dropped from 69,000 all the way to 59,000. That's how volatile this thing can be. But volatility can be your friend. When it drops that low or uh, drops that fast, that's a great buying opportunity. That's when we like to buy. We are going to dollar cost average later, but dollar cost averaging is different than buying that dip like that. And that's a, a great time. That's, that's when the money is made. When that fear is like that, that's when the money is made. And the reason Bitcoin dropped so fast like that 
is because once it reached an all time high, a lot of people have been waiting for that. So this is, that's a perfect time for them to take profits. All right. Before we get into anything else, y'all got anything for for the people? Uh, Tim, oh boy, uh, go ahead, Kara. No, I was just saying Tim, he was talking about as far as using it to buy things. If you wanted to buy something, how would you do it? Yeah, so yeah, if, <laughs> if you use uh, crypto.com, Tan man, if you can uh, go and create an account at crypto.com, I had an account I hadn't used in a year or two, probably since the last bull market. Um, I just re, you know, I didn't even have to reactivate it. I remember my username and password. I went back in. Um, they got a card you can get from crypto.com and you can allocate one of your tokens, whatever in your portfolio, you know, to be tied to that card. So, you know, it's like a debit card from there. When you go out to eat, you go to the store, you don't have to take your money out of your wallet. You can spend it right on that card. If you got some Jasmine, you got some Shiba, you want to have that card tapped in the Jasmine today, you can just do that real quick. And now you can run out and use that card. You want to spend Shiba tomorrow, you can, you know, go in, go into your wallet and make that change. And now you can just go and swipe that card. And, um, you know, that was a pretty cool thing. I ain't used it in years, but it's there if you want to use that. And that way, I talked to you about this a little earlier. You know, when you take your money out of your wallet for good and put it back into your bank account, that money becomes taxable at that point. But as long as it's in that wallet, it's, it's untaxable. It's still in, you know, you're, you're still in the middle of an investment. So even if you have it sitting on a, a stable coin, just sitting there, you know, it's not making any money. Uh, you can leave it in there and it's untaxable. If you want to use your CRO card, um, crypto.com card and go spend it, then that'll work. Hopefully, that's your question, Tim. Man, don't go buy no sneakers, man. PJ, what's up? What? All right, man. What else? Uh, what else? Y'all got anything else? We, we can we jump into these prices? Yes, sir. Yeah, let me um let me show something real quick before we jump in. Um, let's see if I can present my screen. All right, my boy wanted to know about the cycles. So we talked about this one last week, right? This is the eighteen year property cycle. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Right, and the whole theme of this is that every 18 years the housing market is going to peak up at some point um usually around um you know around that 14th uh, 15th 16th year and then it's going to crash and we are right here at this little elbow in the bend of this cycle the last housing market crash was in 2008 barack obama uh was president and you can count back, you know, we're right around that time in that cycle, 18 years. And so it's something to this and to these cycles, right? And, and how these, these things and economics, they all work in cycles. The, the stock market, right, is at all-time highs. NVIDIA is going through the roof, doing crazy things. Bitcoin is going to, uh, to the moon right now, right? Before the housing, doing crazy things. So we're on this part of the cycle where we're expecting a, a peak. Right. This is going to be a very parabolic swing to the upside in all of these markets. You're going to see housing prices continue to be ridiculous for the next year or two. You're going to see stock market prices continue to reach uh, ridiculous uh, levels for the next year or two. Uh, same thing with crypto. And then it's coming a crash. So, you know, of course, we're going to talk about selling when we get to the top and trying to figure out where that top is. But that's one cycle. There's another cycle I want to show y'all, and this is the Bitcoin halving cycle. Let me see if I can find it real quick. The Bitcoin halving cycle. Ooh, I can't wait. Super cycle. There it is. We got about we got about four to five days before it is Bitcoin halving. Yeah, this ain't the best one I wanted to show, but it does show, right? Every time we've had a halving, this is back in 2013. 
right? The first half. You made that, that, they you made that bigger. Uh, this is as big as I can make it. Okay. Uh, this is the first halving they had back in 2013. You see the blue line going up here. You can see the prices came up, and there was a dip before the halving. And, you know, prices kind of uh, bull flag their way up through the halving and just went up after the halving. There was a period after the halving. Um, let me see if I can make that part bigger. Uh where you know they could measure the upside and how far it went up during that time period before it started to decline the price started to drop all right after that drop right we went into the second halving this was four years later this is in 2016. 2016. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and you can see that dip before the halving and prices go up into the halving what happened there is you can see prices start to drop right before the halving and after the halving prices went on its run the bull market right this is what we're calling this bull market right after that halving and it reached the peak it dropped it retest you know did a v wave and it came down again all right before the third halving and this is in 2020 2021 this is the big one Right, the one that a lot of people caught made a lot of people millionaires. Um, the price dropped right before the halving, and it rose through the halving. All right, and it peaked out. This is the 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 all time how that Bitcoin just broke. Right, so this chart isn't even up to date because it would be up here already, pretty much where the halving three numbers were, and that's the difference between this chart and the previous halvings. We never, we've never broken the all-time high, the previous all-time high, until after the halving. That's the main thing I want you to take away from this chart, right? We've never broken this previous all-time high until after the halving. It's usually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, um, you know, a couple of weeks or months after the halving before we we break that all-time, that previous all-time high. Well, this cycle we've already broken. The all time high from the previous. That thing, that thing going parabolic over here. And we still got four, five, six weeks, you know, a whole monthly candle to go. We like, we're on, a ma we're on a magic now. school bus right now. Let's go. And that's why I said this cycle is special. I think some special things are going to happen in this cycle. Um, when I think of cycles, you know, if, as you can see, the, the percentage gain gets smaller, right? From having one to having two to having three. I think having four is going to reset that cycle and we're going to go back to a big jump. Um, it and then we're going to, it's going to be another 18 ETFs. years, right? Before we get back around to um, these type of games again. And we're going to start back over in that cycle. Because so of the ETFs, you know, it's going to go crazy. And, and so, that's the so other special sauce, right? You got the ETFs, you got, um, you know, which I don't think we all comprehend how important that is to, the opportunity that we have and why it's so, such a once in a lifetime opportunity. I don't think we'll ever see the market rally and, and gain as much as we're probably going to see it do in this year and next year in our lifetimes, you know, unless something else special happens. This is special. They just unlock trillions of dollars that, that are expected to come into this market that, ha that weren't there in any of these other previous cycles or habits. And we're about to see what it does. And what it's doing now is, again, we're already breaking the previous all-time high uh, a month and a half before the housing, something that's never been done before. That's how powerful things are right now. So, you know, just spread the word, man. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Go ahead, bitches. Sweet, sweet, sweet. So let's, uh, let's cover these crypto prices. Let's cover the top 10 real quick. Go over that. And then all right, so like I said, last time we last Thursday, Bitcoin was sitting at sixty three thousand. Just enough seven day spans grew ten percent. And that's even with it dropping like a rock. <clears throat> back down all the way to 59 went from 59 back to 67 
six, six seven thousand real quick. If you are an Ethereum holder, you should be happy right now. You're up fifteen percent this week, up to 3,800. 3, it did break four thousand this week. So if you're holding Ethereum, you should be proud of that. Remember Tether USDT. It's a stable coin. It's paid to the U.S. dollar. BNB is on a rocket ship too this week. It's up fifteen, almost fifteen percent. It was up higher earlier today. Is at four sixty six, four sixty five right now. Uh, four sixty six. It was at four seventy five earlier. I Solana. told you, being careful, Solana go catch BNB. Creeping on up. Well, they, they they duking it out right now for four and five. It's yeah. gonna be it, it's gonna be a dog fight, but uh, I'm here for it. So Solana sitting at one forty four. If you're a Solana holder, you should definitely you definitely in good right now. XRP can't say the same for you all, but hey, uh, it's, it's it's doing something, doing better than it was. Uh, USDC is also stable coin. Cardano, not a fan of Cardano, but it's doing okay right now. Eight, up eight nine percent on the week. Dogecoin, thirty six percent. That's actually a pretty nice jump because I remember it being at eight cent not too long ago. Shiba Inu, I think, has definitely been on a rocket, up one hundred sixty eight percent on the week. And it's still a point zero 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 whatever. It ain't even close to a penny. And it's Mark Cap 10. Not a fan of Shiba Inu. But if you're riding that train, um, might be time for you to jump off soon. Uh, don't get left holding the back. This is not financial advice. All right. All that said, um, Anything you got anything else y'all want to talk about before I get on here and dollar cost average? No, yes, going no, once. Okay. All right, let's, let's let's do it. So, uh, I found another exchange that I like better than Coinbase. I don't like Coinbase anyway, I think they're part of the they as I think they're part of the matrix. We're trying to get out the matrix. So I don't want your funds to get trapped in Coinbase. Anyway, uh, the exchange is called Kraken. So we're going to show you all two things today. We're going to show you all how to move the money from one exchange to another. So this, this concept applies for moving it from wallet to wallet, too, or just moving the money in general. So we're going to show you how to do that. That's going to be the first thing we do. Then we're going to dollar cost average again. Now, keep in mind, I have... Um, already signed in on these websites um i have already added my bank account i have already did the personal identification those are all the things you need to do when you sign up for an exchange uh, i will put the link for the exchange in the chat so if you want to sign up for cracking you can um and if you want to sign up for coinbase i'll put that link in the chat too and Mike, pay attention because you go follow these same steps to move your money over to crypto.com if you want to start trading um, using a card. You know what I'm saying? You can follow these steps. I move money from my Coinbase over into CR uh, crypto.com um, just earlier this week, and I moved it back. Because, you know, I'm up and down like that with stuff, but uh, very easy to do. Make sure you pay attention. All right, cool. Let's do it. So. First thing first, I'm already logged into Kraken. This is what it looks like. Let's get out of this and let's just go to <coughs> deposit. I'm going to go to deposit crypto because that's what I'm doing. It says send fund directly from your crypto wallet. Boom. That's what I want. Click that. <coughs> I'm going to select Bitcoin because that's what I'm moving. I can I can go up here and search to just put Bitcoin. You on the wrong screen. Make sure you share the right screen. Right. The other screen. Oh, other screen. my bad. All right, let's start that over. All right, cool. So I'm going to go up here and hit deposit. I want to deposit crypto. Send fund directly to your crypto wallet. That's what I want. I'm going to go ahead and search Bitcoin because that's what I have. <clears throat> It's going to tell me to select the network. Bitcoin network. They got a lightning network. Lightning network. We'll get into that later. But lightning network is supposed to be faster. Bitcoin can be cumbersome at times and take about 15 minutes. 
Apple and Google on the next phones they come out with. Two, three years, they gonna have a lightning network built into your phone. But go right, and that, and that, that's that's what, that's what they're going for. Um, but we gonna go back and sell, select Bitcoin here. <clears throat> All right, it's gonna give me an address. So you got two ways to do this: QR code. All right, you don't have to be afraid of this because you can only send money to this address. If you want to send me some Bitcoin, by all means, use my QR code. So, new wallet address. I'm gonna go ahead and hit this button here because it's gonna tell me to copy this address. So I'm gonna hit that. Now that is copied. Cool. Now I go back to Coinbase. <clears throat> all right. Now I'm back on Coinbase. And now I want to hit send receive. I'm going to go ahead and put the max because I'm going to get all the way out of Coinbase. And then it's going to ask me to what recipient. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that right here. Boom. And that's what I need. Make sure that address is showing up correctly. So I'm click on that. Cool. And it's going. Now I got my total amount is 168.51 to, to, well, to send my maximum amount. And I'm sending it to this address. Preview send. Just going to preview it before we send it. And the network fee. Ooh, that's expensive. $8.16. I'm not going to lie. But it's like that because of. Everybody is using the Bitcoin network right now to send, trade, this, and whatever the case may be. So the transaction fee is a little bit higher than it would normally be. It would normally be about, mm, I'm going to say about $2, not $8. But this is Coinbase too. I don't like Coinbase. That might be a reason why too. Same time says 30 minutes estimate. Let's hope it don't take that long. So I'm going to hit send now. It's going to ask me for my authenticator uh, information. I'm going to pull it off my phone real quick. <clears throat> All right. And it says done. This transaction usually takes about 30 minutes. We're going to pray it don't take that long. But. In the meantime, while that does what it does, um, let's go back. <clears throat> so, in the meantime, while that's doing what it does, let's, uh, that's how you send money from one exchange to another. That's how you send money from one wallet to another. That's how you send money from somebody else to anybody else. That's the way you do it. You need to copy that address you want to send it to. And then you need to plug that address into the place you want to send it from because it's going gonna, it's gonna to need that address. And of course, you want to put the amount. And it's going to pre once you hit the preview button, it's going to show you the fees. It's going to show you how much you're sending. It's going to show you all the necessary information that it needs to show you uh, while you send it. All right. So cool. We just got to wait for that to, to show up now. Go back to Kraken, give you a preview of Kraken. So what's going to happen, I should get an email confirmation that's let me know that that money has been sent. And yeah, I should get an email conversation, confirmation that lets me know that those funds have been sent and it's in the process of getting sent now. Now this is cracking. This is, uh, if you're new to this, which I'm pretty sure most of you are, it can be a little bit uh, overwhelming at first, but it's really not that difficult. So if I wanted to deposit money in general, if I want to deposit US dollar, I would go here, hit, hit deposit again, hit USD. And I'm uh, my bank account is already linked. So it's telling me link, link bank account, link bank transfer. Boom. Let's click that. 
dollar amount. <clears throat> I want I want your dollar. Yeah, link bank transfer. Yeah, that's that's what I want. And the amount. <clears throat> Continue. My bank account. Oh shoot! I thought my bank account was already connected. Let's go back. Out of here. I just want regular crackers, not this cracker. To make life too difficult. Guess it's gonna leave me no choice. All right, whatever. Go back to deposit. I've already done all of this. Y'all want me to do this again? Hold on, let me go off screen real quick. <laughs> While I do this. Connect my bank account. Oh, you still on screen. Oh, Man, they making me go through the most again. Jeez. You can go ahead, just hop on mute real quick. I'm gonna look at some of these charts while you're doing that. Okay, uh, that's done, Lakeith. Let me do, let me do this real quick. Then you you can go for it. All right, go ahead. All right, now I uh, went to deposit. I put a U.S. dollar in there. Went ahead and did that. So now I can uh, trade. Well, it's already up here, actually, but let's hit trade anyway. So I'm going to not do a limit order. <clears throat> I'm just going to do a market order. And that can give you a market order is the, whatever the price is now. A limit order, I can set a limit. And once it hits that price, so right now Bitcoin is sitting at 67198 Let's just say I want to put the price at 67000 Once that price strikes 67000 then it will trigger a buy order for my $50 that I deposited, since it is dollar cost average day. Once again, dollar cost average, DCA, we're just gonna choose market. The total I wanna spend is all my $50, so I'm just gonna pull this lever here, or 100%, or I could've just typed in 50. And then I'm gonna hit buy BTC USD. It says order submitted, you see bottom of the screen. I 
I should get some type of confirmation some from somewhere. History. All right. Look like it took. So it took my fifty dollars, and now I own point zero zero zero. I mean, you know, point zero 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 seven four two one three Bitcoin. That's fifty dollars for Bitcoin, and they charged me a fee. Oh, let's see, they tell me how much this fee actually was itself. No, it won't tell me. Um, let's go back. All right, we got our fifty dollars for Bitcoin. I'm not sure what the fee was because I just apparently I missed it somehow. I don't know. But now we got fifty dollars for Bitcoin. Now I'm waiting for my other Bitcoin to show up. It's probably not going to happen today. But we did two things: we moved Bitcoin from Coinbase to Kraken, and now I'm going to use Kraken from now on for a couple of reasons. These are cheaper. The other reason is. Uh, now we can get a true estimate, a true value of dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin from from zero. Because I had such a long history for Coinbase before I started doing all this podcasting. It won't give me my true value because I was doing it for so many years before. But I've never used Kraken before. First time using Kraken. Obviously, I had to go back and reattach my bank account, which is a, a headache. But this is part of the learning process when you get into the Bitcoin and crypto game. Um, everything is not perfect starting out. I'm pretty sure y'all understand that. If you don't, then this is really going to suck. So wrap your head around it now. Everything will not be perfect. It will not work correctly every single time. But that's part of the growing pains. And that's what we're here for, to help you through that. If you have any questions, any hiccups, or anything comes about. So now, we just like I said, we just bought $50 worth of Bitcoin again today. We just dollar cost average, and once my other Bitcoin shows up, hopefully, uh, maybe by the time we keep get done with these uh charts, it may show up. If it does, we'll continue. If not, see y'all next week and we'll uh review that again. All right, Keith, it's, it's on you. I bet. So, we're gonna take a quick look, man. We ain't gonna be here long. Let's take a look at these charts. Um, looking at the total three. Um, I, I'm thinking this total three is going to go up here and try to touch the all-time high at 1.13 trillion. Why? Because Ethereum is trying to touch its all-time high. And we know that Ethereum runs after Bitcoin, which has already touched its all-time high and is, you know, acting like it wants to continue to move up higher. Um, I believe it will move slightly higher before coming down in the retrace anywhere from that 70 to 75,000 range I'd be paying attention to. If it blows past that, it does. But, you know, that's where that's where I'm looking at a uh, cool down uh, somewhere around that 70 to 75,000 uh, range. So we got total three. This is going to be the market cap for all of your altcoins. Right. We know where Bitcoin and Ethereum is headed. Um, I'm thinking that once Bitcoin reaches its top and Ethereum reaches its top, um, your market cap for your um, altcoins, everything besides Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, you're going to start to notice the people who have made the money from Bitcoin are going to take some of those profits and put them in altcoin, and that's going to drive up the altcoin market caps. So we'll see this continue to rise. Uh, this is a monthly chart. Um, you'll notice, you know, pretty much from where we are now, um, it did some up and down, but let's go from here. Um, it took one, two, three, three months, right, to get to the top from here. Um, and that was before. I think we could get a, a, a nice size candle influx of money once we reach that top on Bitcoin um, and see these market caps go up. That's very possible. Um, right now, your only resistance is going to be up here at around 840 trillion. And the whole reason I'm covering this is to show that we're expecting more money to be poured into those altcoins here. Uh, coming up before we see any kind of resistance or turnaround. Um, Bitcoin dominance is uh, looking on the monthly time frame. All right. Uh, you can see we kind of fell off a cliff here. This is back in um, 2017. Um, we came up here 2019. 
this was the 2021 run. It didn't go that high, right? And we fell off that cliff in 2021. Going into 2022, we stayed sideways. We started to creep back up. We just got on top of this moving average here, the yellow one, uh, pretty much for the first time. If we close out this candle, uh, which we, we actually closed out the last month's candle here on top of this yellow line, um, and we're retesting it now. So I could expect to see uh, a nice explosion of Bitcoin dominance coming soon. Also, um, after we finish, like I said, that short retrace, I think once it gets to around 70 or 75, um, you're going to see a lot of powerful uh, moves in Bitcoin. Uh, as these Bit BMAs Bitcoin going to forever go crazy. What you and mean? We, and we try to go up here. Yeah, it's really set up, like I said, for a super cycle to bounce from this low um, back in 2020, you know, two and 2021. Uh, to try to get up to um, probably you know a very high number um, up in these 70, what, 70 what, what, what he mean what he mean by super cycle is Bitcoin is sitting at sixty seven thousand right currently. They are predicting it to go up to two hundred and fifty, and they saying that's conservative two hundred fifty thousand to be exact. So if you if you can do some simple math, sixty seven thousand to two hundred fifty thousand. I don't know what percentage that is, but I'm about to do some math. I'm gonna let y'all know real quick. All right, go go ahead, Lakeith. Yeah. And so now let's take a look at the uh, Ethereum BTC, um, ETH BTC. Looking at this again, I'm just looking from a monthly point of view. Um, we've been waiting on this breakout. So here's the other side of it. And this is a long term signal down here. You can notice what happened the last time we got the signal this low. Um, this chart took off. Right. The very. Uh, steady uh, steep incline up to the top and we're breaking out of this trend line now and we got the same buy signal that just came up this month in march so this is also a signal that ethereum for some period of time right is going to be stronger than bitcoin that's what the e btc chart is for and you'll start to see ethereum and the altcoin start to get a pump uh, we're flirting right around with that trend line now We've been stuck in this trend line for almost two years now, since August of 2022. So this is a big move if we move out of this trend line. And we've been going down since August of 2022. So 273%, though. That's what it is. 273% if Bitcoin goes from 67000 to 250000 Yeah. That's crazy. So we break out of this trend line, we're going to move up a lot. Um, looking at Bitcoin on a monthly chart, you can see we're coming up into the space where we're really going to see the biggest moves once we get above this red line here on the rsi that's the relative strength index um you see the biggest moves start to happen to the upside so we're just now getting close to that space i might give it another month or so somewhere around uh the end of march right before april uh i think going into the halving and right at the halving we're going to see the biggest explosion of Bitcoin. It's going to be different from other cycles. And, you know, the whole point is to try to catch everybody off guard. They want to leave with as few many, as few people as possible on the train going up. They really want you to jump in while it's already gone. Right. That, that way they're making money and you're not making up. Um, and they're able to sell when you finally decide to put your money into the market somewhere up here and you notice that it's high. You get the news from CNN or whatever that, hey, go put something in Bitcoin. You're already too late. This thing's already left the station. All right. Um, Ethereum, again, trying to reach its all time high, making some strong moves. Um, the only other one I wanted to check out was Jasmine. Let me go to a new chart and just real quick, let's talk about something I peeped the other day. All right. So, what I noticed the other day, this is a chart from. Uh, gate io and uh very something very cool that i noticed here let me get this stuff off of here all right the chart from gate io see if i can make this bigger for y'all this is the last one we go look at all right so back in 2000 and This is uh, 2021, October of 2021. We were pretty much at the same spot with Jasmine. 
that we're at today right we've gained a full clothe on the weekly time frame above this 100 day ema and we know our next target is to try to get up and get on top of this 200 day ema all right now notice what's happening right around this 200 day ema you'll see some wiggly lines over here that's some resistance right we ran into a little resistance we had a retest so you can start to look back in the past and see what the future moves are going to look like with these charts. All right. So the main thing I noticed is that from here, though, it took one, two, three, four, five weeks to reach 32 cents. And a lot of people are sleeping on Jasmine, man. A lot of people said it wouldn't get up as high as it's gotten up now. We're up. You know, we started out down here at a fraction of a penny, point zero zero two cents we're already up to two whole pennies almost touched three pennies and you know people are having these very low ball estimate estimates like jasmine's gonna touch five cents i think jasmine has the potential before the halving in the next four to five weeks based on what i'm seeing in the charts we're already in the over uh bought area so you're gonna see the biggest explosions here I think Jasmine has the potential to run up to 32 cents here in the next four or five weeks. So be on the lookout for a big move from Jasmine. I think a lot of the other altcoins are going to try to uh, touch their all time highs. Some of them already have. If you have Render, Render has already touched its all time high. Uh, you know, some of these other coins have already touched their all time high. Now, Jasmine's all time high is a long way away. I don't think it's going to be that powerful yet, but I do think it's going to touch 32 cents here in the next four or five weeks. Man. That's all I have. All right, so you're shilling Jasmine, you're shilling Render. I ain't going to shield no coins today. You know what I'm saying? Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I just want to wrap this up. Uh, we're going to bring we're going to brainwash y'all some more, some more Bitcoin videos. We're going to definitely find some videos, clip them, and explain them in the way that we understand. Because, you know, we understand things a little bit different. And once you hit up with all that terminology, all them big all them big $100 words, you need to break that shit down to some $2 words, into some, some language that we can understand so we feel comfortable investing in Bitcoin or crypto. Now, <clears throat> I know some people are more familiar with the stock market and those things, but we're really not going to talk about the stock market here unless we have some specific request for stock market. I don't listen really to stock market no more. It's not my cup of tea. Bitcoin is the fastest horse in the race. If somebody is telling you different, they lie. Um, so, once again, thank y'all for tuning in to Black and Black Podcast. Um, and we'll see y'all next week. Don't forget, the day you the day you stop learning is the day you cease to exist. So go learn some shit. <laughs>